broadcast. Good afternoon, everybody. Lunch and Learn. It is the 19th here of December, Wednesday, and we have part two of Bob Condor's talk. You heard part one last month, um, and so he's giving part two today. In terms of handouts, when he gets the handouts put together, he will send them either to me or put them out on the listserv, but they're not available quite yet. So, Bob, we've already introduced you. Everybody's read the, the announcement, so I'm just going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much again for being here with us today and giving us part two of your talk. Rob, thank you, thank you for asking me back, and Dr. Souter for letting me talk about a, a subject that's dear to my heart. And uh, today we're going to focus on on treatment. A lot of people say, "What do you do as as a rehabilitation neuropsychologist who treats sports and other concussions?" And I want to talk about that today. And uh, again, no uh, no conflicts of interest. I don't. All I'm selling are ideas. This one, this has come up before in terms of, you know, what you can do, but you have to stay within the boundaries of your training and education and licensure. I'm a psychologist, but I'm also certified as an EMT by our Department of Emergency Medicine. So I do some medical stuff, but I'm certainly not a physician, but I, I work in tradition, traditional medicine, so I'll talk about that a lot. So just want to remind everybody. And, and Richard's done that about looking at some of the raw AG things and morphology. You, you got to stay within your uh, discipline and licensure. Uh, and some of the, the teams I've worked with, the uh, Carolina Hurricanes, worked with the National Hockey League for 10 years, worked with NC State. At one point, State was number 14 in the nation, but ended the year at, almost in the top 25, 28. But this is this is my one this this near and dear to my heart. This was. Uh, uh, this little guy here getting whacked is my son, and uh, this is a team we work with, the, the team in White St. David's School here in Raleigh for many years, and followed a bunch of these guys and still know them as adults. Bobby just finished a master's in accounting and works for an international uh, financial organization uh, that's centered here in Research Triangle Park, and it's been nice to follow some of these guys and see them uh, grow up and be become uh, really good adults. We're going to talk about number six here who, well, we'll get to him in a, in a minute, but uh, number six uh, has presented some interesting challenges as a person to follow. Sort of going back, I don't want to reinvent the wheel of everything we talked about the last time, but this is the international definition for a sports concussion from the uh, conference that was in Berlin in 2016. Before that, uh, twice in Zurich, then uh, Prague, in uh, uh, in Austria, uh, see so there's my stuff kicking in. But basically, the idea that a sports concussion is is a neurometabolic chemical and not a physical change. Although uh, the uh, thinking about this is changing, there are lots of considered what are considered experimental measures that show brain pathology with things like uh, functional MRI, uh, MEG, uh, quantitative EEG but not so much in the pure, pure physiology. And again, you can't really look at a brain in vivo unless you're doing surgery or uh, an autopsy, and neither of those are uh, good things to do. So basically, a sports concussion is a, a neurochemical, neurometabolic problem. Most of us don't get to see an acute concussion, and that's why uh, my colleague Jeff Barth years ago developed the SLAM model, Sports Laboratory Assessment Model, of being on the sideline and seeing a concussion in vivo. You know, when I worked in the ER, folks would come in by an ambulance, things like that, and they would tell you if, if they could. But what you're going to see here in the next slide is uh, number six. I don't know why my, okay, my cursor goes away. I want you to watch, we're, we're the blue team here. I want you to watch 34 in white doing a legal tackle that ended up with a serious injury. Whoops, serious injury. Um, okay, uh, I've got it paused here. You see 34, and you may not be able to tell. He's basically got a headlock around number six, which is a total illegal tackle. And there are two guys coming in behind him. And what happens, I don't know why the cursor goes on. Here we go. Boom. Uh, it basically drives him headfirst into the field. And you see the other team, the referee right away knows something's wrong. He's uh, asking for the trainer to come over. And you're seeing number six, and then uh, that's uh, our trainer. You can see he's moving his left but not right side. And the coach is going, hey, 
that was that was a headlock. That was an illegal tackle, and the referee never called a penalty. But that was the least of the worries. The trainer, uh, Shannon's wonderful. Uh, she now is a captain in the Army National Guard and was deployed in Afghanistan. Uh, she, she was an amazing trainer. So what happened was that um, he didn't get up. I came over since I was doing sideline work and assessed him, and he had uh, reduced uh, motion and sensory uh, abilities on both the right and left upper extremity, and we were concerned that he had a spinal cord injury because of the nature of the uh, hit. He also was concussed, and he started losing consciousness, and you don't really want a patient to lose consciousness because bad things can happen. Um, the trainer did a couple of things. She took the face mask off. You don't take the helmet or pads off when someone's on the field, especially if you think they have a neck injury, because that would only cause more of a spinal cord, cervical spinal cord injury. You take the fa face mask off if you've got to do CPR, so you can get the uh, uh, back valve mask up there, or however you're going to do it. And I could see him, I see Jackie just fading, you know, behind his eyeballs going deeper down. I'm thinking, okay, here's a teenage boy. What can I do to keep him going? Uh, there's two things teenage boys like. They like girls or food. So I decided to go the food route, and I went, hey, Jackie, Jackie, what's your favorite food? Uh, and sort of this grunt, what's your favorite food? And all of a sudden, you see him lightening up. This He's, he's coming forward from deep in his skull up to his eyes. And, and he says, what? I said, what's your favorite food? And he says, pizza. What kind of pizza? Uh, oh no! And we're talking about food a little bit, but it kept him, it kept him awake. We called the paramedics, but you think everything's going to work out? But the school was not in the GPS system, so it took them a long time to get there. Uh, and it was a really bizarre situation. His dad, a former college football player, came out on the field, started yelling at him to get uh, up. One of the coaches broke down crying. Another coach asked to pray. It was a religious school. I said, sure, we need all the help we can get. Um, and uh, uh, took him, to, finally the paramedics showed up, you know, put him on a backboard, took him to a level one trauma center, and fortunately uh, did all the neuroimaging. There was not a bleed in the head, and there was not a, a lesion on the spinal cord. But what he had was a concussion of the spinal cord. You don't think about you think about head and brain concussions, but you don't think about spinal cord concussions, uh, just what he had. We followed him for a while. My wife, a pediatric neuropsychologist, who helped do the neuropsych testing, the academic testing, and we worked with the pediatric neurologist uh, and help him return to school. Uh, he had actually, before any of this, been diagnosed with uh, anxiety and ADHD and was on Focalin. Uh, the, the other ironic thing about this is this was his first varsity football game and you could watch him run and realize this is a guy who's really going to go far he has this beautiful form anyway he came back to play uh, at the end of the season and I, I followed him and he did really well and then he went off to college and so six years later uh, uh, fall last year he makes his first uh, college touchdown, and then the next play gets hit helmet to helmet, and he's in a college in a different part of the country, so we don't find out about this until around Christmas last year. He got manic. He ran up credit card purchases. He didn't remember the purchase. Uh, he bought his girlfriend a really beautiful bracelet, then later said, hey, where'd you get that bracelet? Some guy gift that to you? Um, he was doing fine academically, except his lab courses and his professors told him he needed to drop and get a medical drop. He came home last Christmas. We did a neuropsych with him. Uh, I did a QEG with him and said, look, you, 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 we really need to talk about you not playing football again. I taught him heart rate variability, which I teach everybody, and I was feeling experimental. So we did some uh, region of interest uh, frontal live Z-score training, only a couple of sessions, so I can't really give that any any credit. Then he went off back again to the uh, next part of the country. And then we didn't really hear anything. Whoops, here's some stuff, the new mind stuff. And what I like about new mind is so user-friendly. And you can sort of just look at 
what I call the speedometers. And here's a guy who is just wired, over aroused and disinhibited, which went along with the behavior, with it, with his spending, with his uh, manic behaviors and stuff like that. This is a different one, sort of a Loretta view that looks at the frontal areas, a middle frontal gyrus and orbital frontal gyrus, and shows also that hyperactivity. And uh, I was concerned, so I had a board certified neurologist look at this. Uh, and his report is fascinating, but part of what he says is frontal lobe dysfunction may present with struggles of executive functioning, including focus, attention, organizing, initiating tasks, following through on tasks, and emotional regulation. And that, that really, uh, really nailed it. So anyway, this is uh, about this time last year, uh, decided, okay, we're not going to do any spring practice. Oh, and then also uh, we're going to go back to school. Also, I had him do the new mind cognitive testing, which I, I try to do with lots of folks. It's very useful, and you can have them do it out of the office. I also use this as a benchmark with some of the pilots I'm working with and doing cognitive rehabilitation. But you can see problems, the memory, episodic memory, auditory working memory, uh, list acquisition, a lot of really important stuff for school. So anyway, it goes back to school. Don't hear anything until about August and get this email. Hey, I, I, I need a letter to clear me to play football. I'll go, what? I can't do that unless you come back. And then uh, didn't hear anything. And I thought, okay, I guess he didn't play football. But I just looked last month to see how he had done this football season. Had a full return to play, six touchdowns, broke the conference record for yards per carry, and carrying yards for game. His academics was good, and he's a neuroscience pre-med major. So uh, I hope he's going to come by again uh, uh, this season if, he, if he's back in town. A lot of times during uh, the Christmas part uh, last year, actually, I saw him. He went off and, and coached in some high, high school conference down in uh, Dallas. So anyway, I got really proved wrong in terms of his – uh, abilities there. So that, to me, reinforces the idea of resilience in somebody with an incredibly, you know, incredibly hard hit there that could have ended up in a spinal cord injury. So again, the idea that uh, concussions are neurometabolic and that sports concussions are really in the minimal spectrum of the overall uh, traumatic brain injury spectrum. There are six things we look at when people come in the office. For students, number three, the ocular motor is one that, is, that really isn't looked at a lot. Uh, the ability to, to focus, to converge your eyes, especially looking at the desk and having to look up at the, uh, the board, the whiteboard of the screen and looking back down again. The eyes don't track right because of uh, a hit maybe to the occiput or just the, uh, the cranial nerves that drive uh, the visual con convergence. And these kids get really nauseous and sick and then get migraines from it. So we want to try to work with that. We refer out to vision specialists. And then you can divide uh, concussions into four main domains, physical, cognitive, emotional, and sleep. And this uh, part here, uh, Lindsay Nelson and Mike McCray at Wisconsin, that postulated this post-acute uh, section here that before wasn't there. It was a, you're okay, you had a concussion, you were acute, you're back to full play. And during this time, all kinds of things, and this is what's uh, problematic and worrisome to me, these are all kinds of studies that show brain uh, abnormalities, but the Institute of Medicine says, well, these are just research instruments, and they haven't proven to have clinical utility yet. So uh, we're going we're gonna to keep hammering away at them. But I do want to emphasize the resilience. The brain is designed to take hits and keep going without permanent damage. There's no specific G-force for a hit. There's self-repairing qualities. And uh, as part of our nature as a human, at least and it varies individually how much force one person, one skull, one head can take. And for some, a uh, low amount, 60 Gs, some 140 Gs, before they'll show any sort of brain abnormalities in terms of cognitive functioning. To me, overall, concussions are dysregulation and autonomic dysregulation and CNS. And some of you heard me tell the story as I started. I learned biofeedback at a Veterans Administration Medical Center in Texas uh, when I was a graduate student at Baylor in 1983, we had uh, hand-built rack-mounted equipment uh, with no filters, so the room had to have a Faraday cage, which was a, a copper wire cage all around to keep the uh, interference from the electrical lights and everything out. 
So the VA has been really ahead of the curve in terms of doing uh, biofeedback and neurofeedback with folks. And then the CNS stuff, we all know the coherence is down, increases in delta and theta, reduction in beta. Generally, the frontal temporal decreases in uh, normal activation. But again, there's no one model for what a, a TBI looks like on a QEG. That's why you have to do it and see what the results are. And the goal overall to me, uh, to piggyback off of Julian Thayer at Ohio State, is to build this flexible and integrative network that can really respond to the demands of the organism, I mean, to the environment, with emotional, cognitive, and behavioral uh, responses that are positive, proactive, and problem solve. And how you do that, where well, that's the rub, and we'll talk about that a little bit. People say, what do you do in your office? Well, uh, patients are, I'm a neuropsychologist, a rehabilitation neuropsychologist, been doing that for 35 years. I uh, basically test people, except I'm one of the, the subset that does rehab. My patients are generally not self-identified. They're not willing to be there. They've told, you gotta go see Condor and pass this exam for you can play again. And some of them are not real happy, and a lot of them, uh, some of them don't feel like they have problems, especially some of the pro guys. The, the benefit that I have is usually I've got a full neurologic and medical records with a physical neurologic exam. All the labs, you know, CBC, hemoglobin, uh, thyroid, uh, B12s, homocysteine, things like that, and the neuroimaging results. And uh, they come in for uh, an assessment with me. I stuck this in about the academic modification because we do that a lot with, uh, you know, not with the pros. Pros don't go to school. Their job is to play foot, football or hockey. Uh, but for the college or high school kids, and there's a YouTube video that we did for the special education program at St. David's years ago. It's sort, of, it's sort of old, and in the middle is an NFL video that I wish I could edit out. Uh, but the guy who did the video left and went to another school. But it talks about all the academic modifications if you're working with junior high or high school students or college students. Everybody gets gets one and two, clinical mental status exam and a neurocognitive exam, a face-to-face -face exam that can last for the National Hockey League is, is meant to be short, about 30 minutes. And, but for most people, it's going to be a uh, three to four hour office visit. Then I do the physiologic concussion assessment or brief uh, feedback. We still have to score stuff the old fashioned way with a hand calculator because it's not it's face to face, pencil and paper, not computerized. And then if I've got time in the first visit, we want to introduce the uh, psychophysiologic methods of intervention, give homework assignments, heart rate variability, sleep, diet, and exercise, and set up monitoring with this program called Neuroflow. The clinical mental status exam is something I really take a lot of pride in and have tried to hone through the years. And I tell people, we're going to take a motorcycle tour around your life, cover a lot of ground real fast, not so much in depth, depth unless we need to go there. So it's not somebody who comes in, oh, I've got a memory problem. Go, okay, well, let's talk about this. But at the same time, I want to know you as a person and everything I can about you including uh, a history, family, educational, vocational, military, avocational, medical, and pharmacologic, the vegetative stuff, sleep, diet, exercise, substance abuse, psych, uh, ADLs, and then the fun stuff. What do you do for fun? Hobbies, civic, church groups, and assess reading ability and computer usage because a lot of my homework uh, requires the ability to, uh, to, to read and use electronics. And at the same time, you're not just get, gathering data, you're listening to the way their speech is, their mood, affect, how they're behaving while they're talking to you, and, and what their thought is, how they're putting it together. Uh, 60, 90 minutes may seem short. The, my my uh, ideal one for doing this is uh, Harry Stack Sullivan, a psychoanalytic psychiatrist who would do six to seven hour interviews and has a wonderful book. About it. I think it's called The Psychiatric Interview, if you want to read that. But uh, that's uh, way too long. But I like this idea of really knowing somebody in depth. So if they come in and say, well, I'm depressed or I have memory problems or I can't pay attention, we really drill down and found, find out what they mean in a very detailed way and how that fits within the con context of their individual life. Some of the folks will have baseline non-injury testing using impact which is the sports uh, computer program uh, vestibular and balance uh, testing and then the SCAD a uh, sideline concussion assessment tool and the cool thing uh, the National Hockey League started doing was the iPad version of this 
so we could have it at baseline and then the trainer could have the iPad if somebody say went up to you know uh, Winnipeg or out to Vegas and got hurt we could do sideline assessment there what we do is this pencil and paper uh, battery that originally emerged out of Penn State Ruben Echemendio is a psychologist there and coach Joe Paterno came to him and said hey Ruben I'm worried about my guys how can we see how they're doing and and Ruben said wow getting Joe Paterno to ask me to do this. So Ruben and some other people, Marge Patukian at Yale and some other sports people got this really nice battery together to look at these domains on the uh, on the right that really are affected by uh, concussion and are important things to know about a person in general. These are the specific tests. I'm not going to go through. Uh, they'll be in the handout, but if you're a psychologist, they'll be in the handout. We've uh, published an article about the tests that we use. And if we've got time for the first visit, you know, I do a lot of stuff. We're going to do the mental status exam, the neuropsych testing, um, start measuring things with a pulse, pulse ox, pulse oximeter, uh, stress card, and then a modification of Sue Wilson's program, and then teach uh, diaphragmatic breathing. I didn't realize it, but I've been doing heart rate variability training for probably 40 years uh, back in my master's program at uh, App State in the 70s. Uh, the behaviorists there taught us to teach people um, Jacobsonian muscle relaxation. I'm sure Dr. Suter remembers that, maybe some of the other ones of you. And also uh, bottle breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, which really is heart rate variability breathing. But we, we didn't tweak it in terms of trying to find that uh, respiratory science arrhythmia. Uh, we give people education handouts, uh, homework record sheets, although now we're doing that electronically, and little 25-cent alcohol thermometers, and then links for some th uh, MP3 files I have, one for stress management, one for pain management, one for acad uh, academic athletic enhancement. Pulse ox, just keep this on the desk, and when somebody's been talking for a while, have them uh, uh, do this. And you, some of the people I see, you know, I see a lot of really sick uh, elder, uh, elderly people. About half my practice is geriatrics, which is anybody older than me, and up to, up to 98 is my oldest patient right now. I asked her to come back when she was 100 because I hadn't seen a 100-year-old, and she said, well, I'll come back when I'm 115, so maybe I'll be retired by then. But basically, an athlete sitting there at rest, your resting heart rate, or if you measure it before you get out of bed in the morning, it's actually a very good measure of your cardiac health. And it should be in, in the low 60s. Um, again, a lot of people come in and they're, they're saying, I don't need to be here. My coach, uh, my doc, my teacher, my mom made me come here. It's a little business card. It's actually an LCD thermometer. And I'll say, well, just put your thumb on there and count to 10. Look away. And let's, let's see what it says. And it's amazing how many people come back with black or they're stressed. Uh, so really nice. And they'll go, gosh, I guess maybe you're right. And then the homework practice. Um, we, we do cognitive rehabilitation. Really don't hear about that in neurofeedback, but we've been doing that in rehabilitation medicine for almost 40 years. The idea that after a head injury or a stroke, your cognitive functions are impaired, and there are specific exercises that you can do. Speech pathology does them in their way, occupational therapy in, the, in their way, and physical therapy actually works a little bit on, on the brain too. What we started doing in, in Richmond, my, my mentor, Jeff Kreutzer at the Medical College of Virginia, uh, we were using an Apple II computer and using uh, programs like uh, 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 Pac-Man, uh, Space Invaders, Frogger, and actually got good improvement. It's really, now we know it's really not the computer programs per se, but the strategies and cognitive strategies we teach people. The new thing I'm using now, before I said I'd use these pencil and paper homework sheets, there's a really nice program called NeuroFlow that is both desktop and smartphone app. And it was uh, developed by a, a guy, and I want to give him a lot of credit because I think he's helped a lot of veterans, uh, a young guy named Chris Molinari who was a West Point grad who was a company commander in Afghanistan, uh, led, led men into combat and came back and had some feelings and looked at his the guys he had led and found that they only went to the VA once or twice and said the heck with it and still were hurting. So he had the idea uh, to come up with this program, not to be a therapist program per se, but an extender. And every day it'll send you a reminder to check your mood, your sleep, their rating scales, uh, things like the, the GAD, the WHO5. Uh, they're, they're all public domain scales. 
and then reminders to do exercises such as guided breathing, visualization, there's a heart rate, uh, 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 guided uh, circle that gets larger or smaller, and then Spotify. And there's a second part to it where it actually will, will sync with uh, uh, wireless Bluetooth devices for heart rate variability and EEG. You can monitor the person on the, on the dashboard and it'll send alarms. Uh, I had one last week for the first time. This is a new feature that has sent me an alarm and said, hey, one of your patients is endorsing suicidal ideation. And so, you know, you want to get right on top of that. But it's, it's really a nice program with both Happy Neuron and Neuroflow. I buy a license and patients use it under my license so they don't pay anything per se for that. And then everybody, whether I do a queue or not, and I don't, you know, there, there are a lot of people that don't want a queue, can't, can't pay for it, don't feel like they need it. But I, I, I use Dr. Suter's new mind programs the cognitive emotional checklist, interpersonal skills inventory, physio, and the cognitive, because it, it gives a lot of data you can't get elsewhere. And the cognitive uh, program, the nice thing about it, we're using it as a check with pilots who are using Happy Neuron for cognitive rehabilitation, and then we can use cog the cognitive uh, program to see how they're doing and progressing with their rehab. And here's just a screenshot of the Neuroflow. I set myself up as a patient. Uh, uh, you know, I would say simulation. No, we, we've been going through some stresses, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a really nice desktop. But what I like about it is the uh, smartphone app for it. And then the other things when some people come in, basically I, what I'm getting now is folks coming in. Hey, I think I've got CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And I talked about this a lot in the first presentation. Uh, and they'll say, yeah, I played ball in high school or college or, you know, I'm a, I'm a pro player. And, uh, I, yeah, one of the, I uh, sent the suicidal ideation last week. He came back in this week, and we started talking, and one of his high school friends played in college several years and then suicided a year ago. And another guy who came in, came back in this week, said, yeah, you know, I'm talking to my NFL buddies, and we're not, we're not doing so good. But what I try to say to them is, you don't have CTE. We're going to find out what's going on because there are a lot of things that have symptoms of that, and we're going to see what we can do. What really uh, concerns me is that people feel victimized by symptoms, especially with pain and migraines, that they're just, you know, being hammered on by this pain, and there's nothing they can do. But through a biofeedback or neurofeedback self-efficacy approach, you know, I can provide them with an action plan and reassurance. If you do this, you will get better. The other thing I say to them, which may sound a little gross, is I'm, I met the pathologist for the NFL who does the brain autopsies. And we talked, and I've seen her pathology slides, and I know what's going on with those. And that gives you a little credibility and say, you don't have that, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that you age well going forward, even though you had these sort of concussions in high school or college or uh, as a pro player. One of the things we do, which is a, a neat program, it takes about 20 minutes to do, and I can add it on. You think somebody comes in for a three-hour exam, you don't want to overtax them. This is Chris Friesen's and my modification of Sue Wilson's Optimizing Performance and Health. Some of you may know Sue as the self-proclaimed grandmother of uh, sports psychology biofeedback, and uh, she's this uh, very, uh, very wonderful uh, little sort of British lady in, in Canada who's worked with Olympic power lifters and uh, helped a lot of people uh, optimize just, you know, elite athletic performance. Like I say, I'm an old psychophys guy, so I want to know heart rate, muscle, skin conductance, temperature. And with this one, these are two pages on, on one page. What, what Chris did was we took some of the stuff uh, out of hers that was uh, good for really enhancing athletic performance and looked at it as a concussion, a really quick concussion test. Here you got the stair, stair step, skin conductance going up over time. During the blue part, people relax. It should go down. It doesn't. It goes up. And then temperature going down, the, the downward stair step. And then I've got all my heart rate variability stuff in here. And, uh, this was a, a BFE program that John Bell modified before he uh, left BFE. And then here's the um, EEG part, uh, CZ. C, as people say, C made her career at CZ, just single channel training and it's done really well. Um, 
got the alpha peak frequency up here in the top left, and then the different ratios for different activities. This was a rookie NHL player who later went on and was voted the best rookie in the entire NHL. But he was pretty hammered here. If you look at his just eyes open baseline theta beta ratio, about 5.57 when it should not be greater than uh, 2. He's got a really nice eyes closed peak here at around 9 hertz, but he's also got an eyes open peak here at 9 hertz. Uh, lots of slow wave activity. Uh, what she did, this part, the imagery is really needed for elite athletic performance to develop imagery and visualization. And we took that segment out to uh, minimize the time of the program. So I can do a neuropsych exam and do all that stuff and then do Sue's program. that gives me a lot of data and have people come back later. This is one, uh, ba basically, if you look at the sort of the, the middle one, the one hertz bends, eyes open and closed, it's abnormal. This this guy just showed up a couple of weeks ago, and um, he said, well, here's what happened to him. Uh, six years ago, he was cleaning his gutters and fell 30 feet off of his roof onto the ground in front of his young daughter. He had a severe traumatic brain injury and multiple spinal cord injuries. Uh, he, has, he was unconscious for several weeks and then has huge periods of both retrograde and anterior grade amnesia. And he showed up in the office uh, and said, I think I've got CTE. And I said, well, let's, let's see what's going on. You've got a lot going on. He's got horrible pain from the spinal cord injury. And he's on some pretty potent me uh, medications such as uh, methadone, uh, Depakote, uh, hydrocodone, but trying to minimize that. And um, so, you know, his alpha peak, you know, is, is pretty good, about nine and a half, but there's no attenuation with eyes closed. So this this is abnormal, then he's going to come back after Christmas for a cue. And then if you don't know about the spinal cord, the, you should look up uh, Netter's uh, medical illustrations. He was a surgeon who's sort of the Michelangelo of medical uh, illustrations. And um, he's done some wonderful uh, artistic drawings of different psychiatric and medical anomalies, but this shows how each uh, spinal cord nerve serves a certain part of the body. Uh, if you remember early on, I talked about Jackie number six having uh, a concussion to a spinal cord that was unilateral. With this guy, uh, he had a C2 injury that was incomplete. Usually you're a full quadriplegic with a C2 injury. And then he had several burst fractures down in the thoracic spine, the lower part of the light blue area. And he walks with a walker and right now in horrible pain, severe depression. So I've referred him to a friend of mine who does a lot of really good psychological work with chronic pain. Here's just this classic stress reaction from Sue's program, looking at skin conductance and temperature. And then, you know, you're saying, well, what's, a, what's the big deal about the autonomic nervous system? If you look on the left, and why does it have anything to do with concussion? Uh, most of those are driven by the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, which is impacted uh, by concussion. Well, let's see, go back to this. All right, ANS treatment, again, the, the bottle breathing, diaphragmatic breathing using temperature, a little 25 cent alcohol thermometer or a $10 digital thermometer using autogenic phrases. Uh, autogenic phrases uh, have been used forever in behavioral therapy and at the Menninger Clinic, things like, I feel calm, my hands feel warm, my hands feel warm and I feel relaxed. And it's a list of uh, phrases, and you read those to yourself. And usually from the top to the bottom, there may be an increase of four degrees in temperature for that. All right. And then sort of getting on to some more stuff here. I, the, the point with this one is the difference between optical measurement and electrical. The optical stuff like Fitbit and Garmin and Apple Watch, they're, they're all optical, and they're good, but they're, they're estimates. The, this is a polar chest strap. Um, I use one of those or one of these sinks with NeuroFlow. It's electrical. It's like a two-lead EKG, and it's much more accurate for measuring that. And you can measure uh, this for things like this is an interesting one uh, from David DeFabio. Uh, let me use this one. This is a NASCAR pit crew measuring heart rate. Uh, if you look at the difference between the two guys doing the outside tires, which get 
more wear most NASCAR tracks. The outside rear guy is just maxed out. His, his heart rate is too high and it's going to take him longer to change a tire, which, you know, you're looking at seconds to do that and he could make errors. Uh, going with this one, basically this, this model has been used in athletic training uh, with the Rutgers soccer team. And by using heart rate, which is just purely biofeedback, they reduced injuries over 70% and increased the vertical jump by 2%. If you just file this away, this is a, a sort of a schema I give patients in, in terms of let's talk about where something is your, your brain. I see a lot of engineers, hardware, your mind, software, and your body. And, of course, you've got 11 different body systems, so I just sort of lump them together. The cardiac correlates of a concussion is that the heart is not a metronome. It should not be with, beat with equal intervals if it does is cardiopathology and you want a lot of variability between your R wave. After a concussion, the variability goes down and there's less cerebral perfusion. And why is this here? Shaw in psychosomatic medicine a few years ago uh, postulated this network going all the way from the prefrontal cortex to the cingulate insula down through the amygdala and then the different pathways for activation for a sympathomimetic effect or a, an inhibitory effect. But I think it goes both ways, that by changing heart rate, we found, and I think the Thompsons have some data and other people, they actually can, can change at least sensory motor rhythm. I'm going to brag a little bit. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Dr. Jack Ginsburg asked us to write an article on heart rate variability and concussion. He said, do you think there's anything about it? I said, I don't know, but I'll look at it. And uh, wrote this article and published it on Frontiers. The nice thing about Frontiers is you can track wherever – somebody is and you can drill down almost to street level with Google but we've had over 24,000 hits and downloads of this article uh, and there's the the uh, DOI for it if you find it interesting all right I'm talking too much let's go into some treatment this is um, using starting with heart rate variability with a marathon runner who had a freakish accident fell had a concussion was knocked out and what you're seeing with these curves in the middle is their respiration and their cardiac curves. And his sweet spot is about five and a half breaths a minute to produce the greatest uh, respiratory science arrhythmia, the greatest variability. You can see over here on the right, he's got more blood flow going, and you've got uh, higher power in the low frequency range. He was, uh, at the time, doing uh, research on an Ebola-type virus wearing a fully self-contained hazmat suit in a control room and was unable to write his dissertation on the com computer. We used heart rate variability and SMR training at CZ as well as some counseling and uh, behavior therapy with him. And he went on, got a Ph.D. in microbiology, immunology, and a you know, a job making a lot of money in a research facility. This is a kid who was uh, started seeing as a junior. Uh, it has fourth sports concussions. The, the waves are not as synchronous, but the same idea, peak to peak with phase. And then again, you see the perfusion. Uh, as pipes open up, your vascular system is really a flexible hydraulic system. Uh, Basically did a heart rate variability, uh, sensory motor at CC, and then a little bit of four-channel live Z-score. I'm sort of conservative uh, for the most part, but I sort of got into that F3, F4, P3, P4, and found uh, good results. He said he was able to concentrate better. He played handball, and he said, you know, uh, I'm playing the best I've ever seen. I can see the ball. I didn't miss one. We, we beat West Point, who've been the champs for the past three years. He graduated Dean's List with honors and is working with a, a high tech startup. This is, uh, I like to go back, uh, this is stuff still in my office. The original Alpha Theta trainer for 1992, uh, hand built in Boulder with a wooden cabinet and real meters and knobs. I'm a, I'm a ham radio guy and I'm still a, what they call a knob guy, not just an electronics guy. And on the right, the original thought technology stuff, the GSR egg is still out there and still very useful, as well as the portable instruments uh, working on the 9-volt battery. Absolutely no computer interface at all. And then now what we got, we got wearable Bluetooth with lots of computer interface. This is, this is my wife. She's got on a Fitbit. She's got a triple physiology sensor, and uh, she's got an EEG headset on. And you got... Uh, 
lots of data like this. I love data. You can almost taste data. The one on the left is my workout at the Y Saturday morning and the right, uh, the right uh, uh, stationary bike one using the Polar. Okay, well, we sort of know this and talked about the changes and what happens. And what we're trying to do is really to normalize functioning, reduce slow waves, increase uh, uh, coherence, either re uh, reduce hypercoherence or increase hypocoherence. Oh, this is a guy who just came in this week, uh, and he was he would get so concussed playing football he'd end up in the other team's huddle, which is a no-no. He when he left football, he had got a master's degree in education, has been an educator, but he has had us he's been a closet drinker for 40 years and has now been sober for three months in his early 60s. Came in this week with his wife and is really interested in doing stuff, and he'll come back for a cue, and he wants to do more stuff. He's the one who says, hey, my NFL buddies are really hurting. We've got a, uh, a side specialty that just sort of serendipitously happened of working with concussed pilots uh, who've had uh, a concussion or some with anxiety or some with ethanol problems. They lose their FAA uh, license, and they're good people who just had things happen, so I'm working to rehab them. This guy was riding his bicycle on a, on a path through the park system. Uh, a tree limb was down, hit it, got knocked off. He had a helmet, uh, fortunately, because he ended up with a skull fracture. Interventions with him. We did the cognitive rehabilitation, and we started with uh, biofeedback with a, a flight simulator. And the pilots love it. Hey, man, I'm flying a, I'm flying a, uh, you start with a biplane, then you can do a B-1 bomber, or, you know, F-14 or whatever with my brain. Uh, my my go-to really is pretty simple. It's sensory motor rhythm training at CZ, and then some live Z-score stop. This guy did everything. I have I have no idea what he did because he would go. He would come in and say, "Oh, I started doing this. I read Dr. Perlmuter's uh, book. I bought these supplements." So after six weeks, this is using a Richard's program. This is twice a week for six weeks, and you can see some really nice change overall. But uh, uh, can't attribute everything to the neurofeedback because this this guy is just the most motivated person I've ever met, and he has a, a class two medical now. He still has to go come in for checkups, but he's doing well. And then this this was interesting. This guy flew Apache helicopters in Iraq and Afghanistan. Had a little PFO, uh, platinum uh, foramen ovale that we have naturally as babies. as a hole between the atrial and ventricle parts of the heart that close up, but his didn't, and he had a stroke. Um, and he had basically the same uh, treatment as the other pilot. Start, you know, like I say, these guys love it. Oh, man, I'm flying a plane with my brain. And then uh, up to SMR, uh, live Z score stuff. And he passes his uh, cue early on, sort of a low power cue. It doesn't show the focal part. It was a right parial CVA, uh, but it shows up a little bit over there around T4, T6. Uh, but he's back doing flying, uh, flying EMS helicopters uh, down on the, the coast in the Outer Banks, which is sort of hairy. Uh, it's doing doing real well. Here's just a guy who uh, I wanted to show you. He, 600 NHL games, three Stanley Cups, six concussions, and uh, a little bit of occipital stuff probably when he fell. These guys, a lot of times, they'll either get boarded up against the, the glass boards uh, which now are plastic and give, and that's an engineering thing that's reduced concussions, or they'll have their, uh, uh, they'll go back, hit the back of their head. All right, this one I put in because this is really interesting. This is a guy who is an ice climber and would climb glaciers and waterfalls 20,000 feet up in the Andes and say it was the most relaxing, calming thing that ever happened to him. His injuries came from getting rear-ended twice, here in Raleigh by some idiot texting on their phone and he got hurt so bad he had to have two cervical spine surgeries because he got hit twice. Uh, he went in and, and did a cervical uh, spine fixation uh, two different times. Interesting thing is that he couldn't tolerate anything on his head. He didn't like neurofeedback, biofeedback, he didn't like photic. So I was stumbling and found, oh, let's try this. And there's a little electrical stem through your earlobes and he loved this. And this is this is not him, but just a representation of what the electrical stem does. Uh, so he did that and um, uh, 
worked with him for probably a year and a half. He also was a meditator and used his own meditation early on, but had a lot of uh, results off of that. I, I'm going to, uh, well, Stephen, let's just, uh, look at the time here. We've got way too much. Stephen, a uh, soccer player, star soccer player here, went off to college, got a concussion, got depressed, dropped off, uh, sorry, dropped out, came back in, and he was just severely depressed. Uh, and did a neuropsych on him and said, hey, I want you to come back. I've got this new treatment I think will help. He'd been seeing child psychiatry, which was really very useful, but still horribly depressed, and didn't hear from him, uh, from him for about three or four years, and he came back in. He said, hey, you remember you talked about doing that thing to my brain? I went, yeah, sort of. He said, I want to do it now. I said, okay. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, you know, I was planning on killing myself, and I thought I would be dead, so there's no point to come back and do it, but I'm feeling better now. And that just was a real shocker because he had snookered both his psychiatrist and me, and he was really morbidly depressed, but uh, doing well. Just talked to his mom, or she left a voicemail a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's not really doing active treatment with me. I've got him using a portable uh, EEG device. He had horrible sleep apnea, and he's using a CPAP. He's exercising every day and changed his diet and, and doing really very well. I want to want to do, well, let's do this one. Okay. This is uh, sort of the schema for what happens with injury. Uh, Aaron Bigler, who supervised me down in Austin, Texas on my internship, is really one of the best known neuropsychologists in the world, postulated this model that's not real good for those of us who had concussions through the years. You've got this idea, you're gonna, we're gonna lose reserve anyway as we age, so you wanna have really good reserve. You don't wanna have metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. You wanna be in really good shape over here in middle age, or you're gonna have real problems when you hit 60s. But anyway, you're gonna get this anyway. You get a TBI, you drop down, you recover, but you don't go back to this postulated baseline. And the idea is, Sorry, it's whether you're going to uh, spam calls. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, uh, whether it's additive or synergistic, hopefully it's additive. Because synergistic, we're, we're going to uh, crash and burn. I think I told you in the first time, I had a, a moderate pediatric uh, TBI at age nine from a fall in a house, was hospitalized, had concussions, playing ball, rock climbing, bike racks, and the last one was a car wreck at, at 57. Uh, 11 years ago, and uh, what I do is is try to do the big diet, sleep, and exercise thing, and uh, work my brain. So here's a here's something picking up from Tom Dzinski's brain brightening idea. You know, with with aging, and I'm seeing uh, I mentioned another part of the practice or geriatrics, seeing a lot of older professionals, doctors, and college professors. We've got major universities around here: UNC, Duke, NC State. Uh, and uh, two medical schools, and, f and who don't want to stop. You know, people just don't want to retire at 65 when they're professionals. They want to keep going. So what, what can we do? Well, some of that, or the aerobic exercise, 20, 30 minutes intense exercise, five days a week or more, the working memory computer exercise we talked about, uh, cranial electrical stimulation or auditory visual entrainment. Dr. Suter has done some great presentations on photic. I really enjoyed uh, neurofeedback to try to, you know, the, the easy thing, increase, increase alpha, alpha peak frequency. There's new research for the photobiomodulation um, with, with devices like Violite. And there's really good research. I've been impressed with the level of research coming out, even looking at small end studies of people with moderate to severe dementia showing good improvement on their ADAS COG, which is a measure we use to measure efficacy with uh, psychopharmacology as well as for ADLs. And then sort of the what I call the holy three of uh, holy trinity of good aging, diet, sleep, and exercise, as well as community involvement, doing things, giving back, being part of a church, uh, uh, working for Habitat for Humanity, working at the food bank or food kitchen, uh, engaging in altruism is good for the heart and for the brain. 
Okay. A lot of this, this will be in the handout. We're getting low on time here. We talked about a lot of this in terms of what you can do. You know, there, I'm sorry, there's my Holy Trinity. Early on, you want rest. We used to think you'd sh shut people down for one or two weeks, and now I realize after two or three days, if you shut down a teenager or a pro athlete, it's really their uh, longer symptom uh, uh, burden and presentation for them. I had a, a mom call me up one day and said, hey, my son, I'm really worried about my son. He's hallucinating. So what happened? We had a concussion, and the doctor said put him in a dark room for four or five days and with no with no light, uh, no cell phone, no computer. Uh, so some of you probably know what I'm talking about right away. He had sensory deprivation. He was like being in a sensory deprivation tank. So bring him in. And he came in, and we and we put him back, sort of plugged him back into the world a little bit. You want to do it in a mindful way. Uh, but a shutdown for a couple of days is really needed to let the brain uh, recover. The visual therapy we've talked about, we refer to uh, physical therapy, uh, vestibular specialists, ocular motor therapists, hand downs, and the heart rate variability. You want to get in that low frequency range. Medication, there's no magic bullet medication for uh, TBI. You generally treat the comorbidities such as migraines, but we see so many people, hey, I'm on all these migraine medicines that they make me feel bad and I still have headaches. And we don't say stop the medicine. We say, let's look at these other things that you can do to work and make your migraine better. And then the exercise is medicine. I wanted to go and end on this because we did talk about optimal performance or want to, this idea of being in the zone and using a lot of the same techniques that we talked about for concussion rehabilitation. What's the zone? If you've ever been there, it's a wonderful experience. I've, I've been there just a little few times in my life. It's this automatic performance without overt control, total focus, confidence, loss of self-consciousness, altered perception of time and objects, at one with your visualization, going back to Sue's stuff early on, you know, where you're visualizing the ski jump, you're visualizing you're hitting a ball, and the perception, you know, you, the, when a pitcher throws a ball at 90 miles an hour, that's faster than the retina can process it. But some of the batters who are good will say, you know, that ball slows down and gets bigger. It's like the it's like a beach ball, and I can hit a home run with it. Or you're out, you're you know, you're you're in, and all of a sudden you see this football, and it's coming like a big football, slow and spinning elegantly in this wonderful parabolic arc, and just lands right in your hands. And there's a sense of joy and effortless recovery after stress and failure, optimism without illusion. But I see if I can. I don't know if you can hear the sound on this. I can hear it here and. Some of you may know this, the opening scene from this wonderful movie called Chariots of Fire about the 1924 Olympics. Just look at the joy in these guys here. Just the ecstasy of what it feels like. Uh, he's struggling a little bit. But if, you, if you've ever exercised or done something in life, anything, I mean, it could be crocheted and have that feeling of ecstasy. It's a wonderful place with optimal performance. I, I relate to this because I'm an old cross-country runner, and a few years ago, I got a chance to run where they filmed this movie, which is on the beach at St. Andrews, right next to the old course, one of the oldest and most uh, well-known golf courses in the world. And I was very fortunate. My wife's uh, cousin is a physician in Dundee, Scotland, who teaches some at St. Andrews and a runner. And we were we actually played a round of golf there, which was funny. And she said, hey, you know that movie? It was filmed here on the beach. And they have YouTubes of me that uh, are nothing like that. So, again, assess, reassess, uh, 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 treat, but be positive. Monitor compliance, ensure compliance, or war compliance out of the office, and that's really what I want to do for a lot of these folks. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna say th thank you now. This is Eric Stahl, who unfortunately got traded, but was one of these guys who just was an exuberant uh, hockey player and was incredible to watch. So that's about it, Richard. Uh,
You okay, still hey, great, Bob. That's uh, unfortunately we're out of time for questions. This was just chock full of wonderful stuff. I'm sure people did have lots of questions. Um, and uh, if if uh, I'll take a the pulse here of the of the crew and. Uh, uh, if they got the list of questions, maybe we have you back and just have some question and answer and discussion. There's so much of value here for those of us doing neural feedback. Um, and, uh, oh, and I think it could just really help us all um, do a better job and, uh, you know, and, uh, and maybe some people would like to contact you and, you know, uh, find out more, or talk more about some of their clients. Sure, I'd be I'd be happy to and uh, happy to entertain questions. You you have been so helpful to me. I don't know anybody else who does the lunch and learns like you do, three times a week, and you're there with your expertise. It's just uh, fantastic. Yeah, we just not me. It's you know all these wonderful people who uh, come on board and um, and they're doing all of this stuff. Some of them have been doing it for 10, 20 years and they all contribute like you. And it's just a wonderful um, resource, I think, for all of us doing uh, neurofeedback and dealing with all these different disorders. So, uh, but thank you so much for uh, sharing all of your experience and wisdom in this topic. It's, uh, I think you have a unique uh, 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 data set, you know, in your, from all your experience. And I think uh, we could really continue to uh, learn a lot more from your experience uh, in the future. So we look forward to having you along, for maybe for just some chats. I bet a lot of people would like to ask questions. Oh, sure, happy to. And, and I will do the I will do the handout. <laughs> Great. All right, well, yeah, people are just going to really want this handout. I can see uh, there's stuff in here I'd like to get my hands on for sure. Okay. Great. So we look forward to it. Okay, everyone. Well, it's. It's past the hour. This has been fantastic. Uh, we all learned a lot. Um, and uh, let's get together again uh, on Friday. And um, maybe you all have some questions that we could share and build a list so we can have Bob back and ask him some of these questions. Um, so have a great uh, week. And thanks again, Bob. And uh, we'll see you.